Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I welcome you to this installment of Table Talk, a series of conversations with academics and writers who we admire who work on human animal relations. With the Indian Animal Studies Collective and my co host Anu Pandey is also here. I'm Susan Harris. I'm a PhD student at IIT Delhi. The Indian Animal Studies Collective aims to bring together academics and writers who are working on animals in India. Um, for today, we have with us Sophie Chow from the University of Sydney, and we are here to discuss her essay, We Are Not Monkeys, We Are Monkeys, Contested Co Cosmopolitical Symbols in West Papua. Uh, please feel free to ask a question uh, to Sophie at any point, simply unmute yourself or raise a hand or put the question in the chat box. Uh, please don't wait till the end or towards the latter half to ask a question because it's a very informal mm -hmm. event and we just talk to each other. Um, so I thought we could start the discussion, Sophie, with, uh, with the title itself because throughout the essay, you pay a great deal of attention to showing that um, you know, the, the activists, when they talk about the symbol itself, they, on one hand, they want, they want to distance themselves from, from the, from the monkeys, but on the other hand, they want to kind of embrace the idea. And this is the tension that runs through the essay. So maybe you could um, tell us about that tension and how the monkey itself figures in that conversation. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much, Festival Anu and Susan, for inviting me to speak in this platform. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm speaking to you this afternoon from the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here in Australia. So I just want to start by acknowledging um, the Indigenous elders past, present, and emergent, um, whose lands I live and work on. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, reading my article. Um, as you rightly point out, Susan, um, the title, uh, and particularly the sort of bracketed knot, um, is, is trying to point to the really very diverse uh, and complex ways in which Babuan uh, human rights activists understand the identity of this um, monkey as a living organism and as a political symbol uh, and the ways in which they're often quite creatively torquing um, the, the, you know, the racialized, uh, bestialized uh, symbolism of this species to make a claim about their own humanity uh, and their own ongoing sort of denied claims to, uh, to political sovereignty. Um, so, so the article fleshes out um, sort of six propositions or six, six different ways in which Papuans um, understand that indexical or antagonistic relation between the monkey and Papuan beings who continue to be subject to deeply racializing, uh, you know, prejudices um, in, in what is an ongoingly settler colonized part of Indonesia. Um, and I think uh, what the title tries to do is, um, you know, and those six propositions, um, is trying to offer a kind of cosmopolitical uh, lens into uh, the question of uh, politics and identity and that messy intersection of race, ecology, politics, and culture, right? Um, and in particular, I suppose, the article is trying to point to the incredibly, I suppose, creative and critical and heterogeneous ways in which indigenous peoples themselves are um, thinking through um, interspecies and interspecies forms of violence um, and alliance um, and solidarity and resistance uh, and justice, I suppose, um, both for humans and for more than humans. Yeah, uh, you know, even in discussions of um, caste and how the animal as a symbol is figured in those conversations in India, uh, one of the things that always comes up is if the animal as a figure, if the animal really transcends into something more than a symbol. But, you know, in, in your essay, you, you uh, do emphasize that for the activists, as well, even if they're advocating for humans and uh, ostensibly human rights issues, there is uh, there is a sense of the monkey um, as this embodied presence, uh, 
who is more than a symbol. So is that is that why why do you think um, that presence gets lost in these conversations where um, the animal is figured as a symbol prominently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And perhaps, you know, looking back at that article, um, it's always funny when you go back to things you've published and realize, you know, you could have said something other or different. Um, but you know, perhaps, perhaps more than the symbol, perhaps the monkey is functioning here as what Donna Haraway might call, what Donna Haraway might call a material semiotic figure. Um, that, that could have been a more generative lens. Why? Because it brings together the symbolic dimensions of the species. Um, one that exists as a symbol for many Papuans because they've never actually encountered um, or, or seen a monkey themselves, right? This is not a native species to, to Papua, um, which for many Papuans is, is sort of ironic, right? And they are being labeled. And, um, they are being associated with a species that doesn't actually live in their lands and forests and territories. Uh, but there's also something, you know, people also, you know, many Papuans have traveled to Java and Bali um, where they might have seen monkeys. Um, they are aware that, um, you know, monkeys also inhabit particular kinds of ecosystems and um, entertain particular kinds of relationships to human communities in other parts of Indonesia. Um, so that's that, that's sort of the, the logic underlying that proposition that, monk, you know, Papuans might not be monkeys, but monkeys still matter, right? Um, in other places, in other times, as part of other kinds of multi-species communities. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, a sort of a vowel um, on the part of Papuans that um, even as they themselves are being racialized through an indexicality with the monkey, that doesn't mean that the monkey itself does not have its own perceptual meaningful, meaningful life world. Um, so there's a claim to, 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 to identity and to the right to, to be and live and thrive that's kind of distributed um, across species lines there. Um, so that, that, that's one of the six propositions anyways, um, is that claim that even if, if monkeys are racializing symbols, they also ma matter as, as biotic life forms with legible historical political and cultural significance in other places and times. Um, and so if the monkeys are actors with um, political lives of their own, um, so do they, so when we're talking about the material semiotic existence, do you mean the material semiotic existence um, outside of that conversation? Because um, sometimes I get the when when I think about cosmopolitics, it seems like you know there's a sense of um, the self figuring out um, what the political is and um, how to situate oneself politically. So in that, so in such a framing, I suppose it would make sense to use the monkey or figure the monkey as a symbol, but then. Mm -hmm. Um, the material semiotic existence of the monkey would be outside the conversation, out in the world. You know, even if um, the monkey is being used as a symbol, the monkey has his own life out in the jungle. So when we talk about the materiality, is the materiality that is out there, um, which is not connected to the material life of the human? Because as you, and I was so struck when I read the essay that, it's the monkey is not a native species and it's it's in that way an alien figure that's that's a great question um susan and yeah thank you for bringing all of this back into the sort of broader frame of of, of cosmopolitics um which of course i'm i'm borrowing from from isabel stenger's latour and others um so yeah certainly the materiality of, of the monkey is not one that uh, Papuans themselves encounter or know um, in their own everyday lives, because as I was saying, it's not a species um, that inhabits their particular part of the world. Um, it's a species that it, whose materiality is mediated um, through, you know, um, photographs they might have seen, videos they might have seen, uh, YouTube, you know, the sort of uh, the media world, right? Um, and a lot of Papuans, you know, know that in other parts of Indonesia, um, the monkey is, is revered um, in Bali, for instance, which is a Hindu, primarily Hindu island of Indonesia. Um, the monkey, the monkey is a god. Um, again, that brings up some, you know, that that that's has often been seen as, as somewhat paradoxical on the part of Papuans, right? Why is this 
species being deployed as the racializing slur, when at the same time we know that some Indonesians also consider it a venerated and um, sacred species, right? Um, so, so I think, you know, in the context of the, the cultural political framing, um, what, what all of this to me points to, you know, cultural politics, it's as Isabel Stenger's right, it's, it's not about um, necessarily resolving conflict or identifying a sort of final solution or peace or harmony in the Kantian sense. Uh, and I think that comes across really strongly in the very different ways in which Papuans, you know, signify the monkey. Um, perhaps it's more about bettering conflict, right? Um, identifying all the uncommon ways in which this species matters um, to, to Papuans, to, to Indonesians, um, without necessarily coming to a solution or a resolution um, or a common ground, but perhaps in fact multiplying the sort of uncommon grounds um, that produce the monkey um, as a symbol, um, as a life form, as a materiality um, in, in, in deeply situated but also untangled ways. Um, so I don't know if that, that quite answered your question, um, but I think this is not a materiality in the sense of the flesh to flesh encounter, for instance, um, that Haraway invites attention to in her sort of take on more than human relations. This is a very much, this is an imagined relation. It's a speculative relation rather than a material one. And yet even in the absence of the material encounter, meaning is still being generated and um, symb symbolic ideas are still being generated. And more than that, they're being played with and torqued and, and brought into tension with one another, right? Um, so that's, uh, I think, what's, what's going on in this particular context. It, yeah, I, I think I know it, it's such a difficult thing to think about in some ways, because it, again, when we're thinking about um, non-humans or not animals as symbols in these conversations, the, um, the next question that arises is if there is possibility of a cross-species solidarity. So if, mm. if monkeys were introduced, I, I rem in the essay you talk about how these um, symbols, you know, they, people become aware of them through movies like The Planet of the Apes, in, which is in a way where the monkeys are very much present in the world alongside humans. But, um, you know, this kind of talking and this kind of forming alliances, would it, would it be possible, um, would it really translate to ethical relationships with the, um, with the other um, in a material world? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think one thing that, you know, came out really strongly in, in the interviews that I conducted um, was the fact that as much as monkeys and Papuans are different species and do inhabit different perceptual life worlds um, and geographies, um, the fact that they share a forest in common as a home and a habitat uh, was, was repeatedly emphasized uh, by many of my interlocutors, right? So we're talking here about a particular Papuan community, um, one among many for that matter, who are rapidly losing their customary forests to mining operations, to oil palm plantations, uh, to pulp and paper operations, right? There's a massive uh, landscape transformation happening. Um, and in that regard, um, they see themselves as experiencing a, a similar kind of, um, you know, going through similar experiences to, to, to monkeys in other parts of Indonesia who are also losing their forests to similar kind of extractive projects, right? Um, so that shared sense of, uh, I suppose there one could identify a sense of a shared community of fate, um, to borrow Deborah Bird Rose's term, that operates across species lines um, in the broader context of industrial human activity, um, you know, the anthropocenic sort of dynamics of the current epoch, um, in which both primates and people um, are facing similar sort of um, uh, erosion of their of their life worlds, um, of their of their shared futures and, and interspecies flourishings. Um, so perhaps that's one possible avenue where one could look for interspecies alliances and solidarities um, in, in this age of, of self devouring growth um, in which marginalized human and other than human species species uh, are bearing the brunt of, of capitalist illogic and the sort of pursuit of profits um, and, and, and developments of lands without consent um, and without um, yeah, attention to the way that undermines both human and more than human life worlds. That's, that's really helpful, Sophie. I think Anu has a question. Go ahead, Anu. Thanks, Susan. 
Uh, this is just to add on to what we were talking about now, uh, this question of uh, cross-species solidarity. You also mentioned at the end of your article, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the activist who was speaking right now, but uh, the idea of, you know, we hope that the monkeys and we will survive. So there is already a sign of, yes, uh, the survival of both of us is at stake here. And in that sense, there's already a notion of solidarity. Um, but then I found in another statement, a sort of an undercurrent of solidarity or possible solidarity, uh, which could be perhaps, um, you know, in this idea of monkeys are not yet human, which is something that distinguishes them from the other animals that are used then as slurs uh, in, the, in that context. Uh, for example, pigs and uh, dogs, I think you've mentioned. So, that, of course, is used in the discourse of uh, the Indonesian state tries to educate us, infantilizes us, uh, um, pits us as uh, primitive, uneducated, and we need to be improved, that sort of a thing through education and infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I wonder if in this monkeys are not yet human, there is somehow like this little tension, this little undercurrent of they're almost human. They're in that sense closer to us than um, let's say dogs and pigs could be. So, you know, we are more likely to put on the headdress and for costume of a monkey to protest, but probably not that of uh, the pig or the dog. And I understand that possibly the monkey is the biggest symbol here, the most prominent one. But would you tend to read this also as, um, as a sign of a potential solidarity perhaps? Hmm. Mm, that's that's a really that's a really good point, Anu. Um, you know what's really interesting? You know, in the article, um, I use the term, you know, not yet human, right? Um, but uh, people would switch between not yet human and almost human. Um, you, you said nearly human. There's there's a little difference there, um, but they were using both, and I think in both instances, it's pointing to the sense of a yeah, they, they very much see themselves and monkeys as part of a kind of a broader spectrum. Um, of life um, in which each life form is also sort of dynamic and, and transforming. And, and those, so yes, there are certainly, and there's something about the figure of the monkey um, that is um, more human-like than a dog or, or than a pig. Um, and here, I think the other thing that really, um, that does matter is, is, is blackness, right? Um, there are, it's particular uh, monkey species that tend to be um, deployed um, in sort of Papuan activist movements uh, and it's black furred monkeys. It's, it's gorillas primarily. It's not uh, chimpanzees. Um, it's, it's the blackness and that is meaningful of course uh, because the animalization of Papuans is not just, you know, they're labeling as monkeys, it's, it's black monkeys. Uh, and the, the Indonesian slang that's used, ketek means specifically a black furred monkey. Um, so I think, you know, race here and species intersect in, in really interesting ways. Um, but yeah, whether, whether Papuans understand or certainly my interlocutors understand the, the monkey as not yet human meaning, what kind of time scales that transformation might, um, I haven't thought to ask, um, but, but that I probably should. I think what's, you know, what's really interesting about the not yet or the almostness um, is what you, is exactly what you touched on, right? The sort of um, progressivist social evolutionary discourse within which the racialization of Papuans as monkeys, um, you know, is articulated, right? This idea that they are subjects of development that need to be alleviated or salvaged from their poverty and backwardness, right? Um, so that's the kind of, uh, yeah, the very colonial kind of discourse that accompanies those kinds of, um, yeah, state and corporate idioms of, of developmentalism. Um, but it's, it's a really good point. And I, I think I'm, I'm gonna have to go back to my, to my friends and, and, and pose that question to them. <laughs> Thank you, Anu, for that. Um, yeah, just to go back, and this is because my own position keeps like shifting from one to the other um, about this um, thing about solidarity. You know, I, the I also realized that um, these people are protesting and they are protesting from this place of um, great suffering and abjection. And, um, you know, in a way, it's 
I, I don't think you know, one could ask them the questions I'm asking you. Um, look, look at them in their face and ask them if they would consider um, alliances with non-humans when they are fighting for survival, fighting for their identity and so on. So I wanted to ask you if the um, if the setting of the protest, if if that changes the cosmopolitical proposal in some sense, if that really changes the parameters, if that impacts the alliances that that's formed between um, you know the humans and the symbols and the possible alliances between humans and non-humans, how crucial is this? Um, is the context of protest to the cosmopolitics that you're talking about? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, the, the protests that I was describing, um, well, first of all, they were unprecedented in, in scale um, and distribution. They were happening in Papua, but they were also happening in other parts of Indonesia, uh, including in alliance with uh, Indonesian activists um, and human rights advocates um, who very much decry uh, the racialization of, of, of Papuans. Um, so there were inter-human alliances and solidarities also part of those protests. Um, and yeah, I do think the context of the protest matters here. Um, why? Because, um, you know, it was the protests were, well, first of all, it was one of the few instances in Papuan modern history where there's actually been international attention to what's happening in a part of the world um, where, you know, that receives very little media coverage, um, despite the ongoing, ongoingly volatile and violent um, political situation. So in some ways, um, you know, the fact that there was a global audience that was turning their gaze to Papua in this moment did mean that it mattered, you know, to 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 to, to wear um to wear monkey costumes, to claim a human identity, um, to is true or to or to embrace the monkey identity for other reasons, right? And there were audiences um watching in that particular moment. Uh, but I think this this you know it's not only in protest contexts um, that trans species solidarities are emerging, and there are others as well. Um, ones that I witnessed uh, during the course of the eighteen months that I spent living in in, in villages in Papua, um, where as I was saying earlier, deforestation and oil palm expansion are radically reconfiguring um, local landscapes. Um, so one example of a trans-species solidarity is between uh, humans and bamboo plants. Uh, a lot of marine activists in Papua are planting bamboos um, in oil palm plantations or along the boundaries to reclaim lands that once belonged to them and that were taken without consent by the government and by corporations. Um, the bamboo is becoming a weedy ally quite literally weedy because bamboo grows very, very fast. Um, it's really hard to control and it can very quickly take over entire patches of land that were supposed to be for oil palm, right? Um, so it's a kind of uh, ally in the sort of counter-capitalist sabotage movement um, that some activists are involved in. Um, another group of species that Papuans um, are forging sort of imaginative, but also material forms of alliance with are, are parasites of oil palm. Um, so in the monocle crops that are being established on their lands, there's a whole diverse um, community of critters who are parasitiz parasitizing oil palm. Um, they include beetles, bugs, caterpillars, um, fungi, molds, and so forth, um, all of which are undermining the growth of this cash crop. Um, and in doing so, um, becoming a kind of uh, non-human ally um, in Papuan's own struggle against oil palm plantation expansion, right? Um, and the activists there um, certainly talk about these insects as, as their friends um, and all palm as the enemy. Um, so that, that's another context in which, uh, another context um, alongside protests, organized protests, where these forms of trans-species solidarities um, are emerging. And the fact that they're emerging in a plantation as scenic context, um, I think is really interesting um, because of course, there's been a you know, huge body of scholarship and critical race studies and literary studies, um, some of which I cite in the piece um, that is precisely looking at you know, similar kinds of interspecies solidarities and alliances um, that emerged in the heart of darkness that was 
the colonial plantation regime, um, you know, across humans and plants and animals um, in ways that very much counter and push against the kind of human centric logic of these plantation scapes through, um, yeah, emergent interspecies kinds of um, friendships and, and, and solidarities and, and justices, I suppose, micro justices. And I know Darren's in the room and probably has a lot more to say about that, um, given his areas of research. But feel free to jump in any time, Darren. Do you know, do Thanks you want to ask a question? Yes, hello. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Chow, uh, I'm sorry I, I couldn't access your full paper. So, pardon me if I uh, sound stupid. But, um, you know, the racialized uh, figure of the monkey is a uh, uh, European colonial, Western colonial concept, you know, uh, and I'm also unfamiliar with the Indonesian and the Papuan uh, colonial history, so pardon me for that. But then again, when I uh, think about India, in India, the monkey uh, is a religious figure, you know, we have a monkey god. And uh, in India, monkey has a religious significance. So if in a country like India, a racialized or a marginalist community has to fight for their uh, right. How can they engage a Western racialized figure of the monkey uh, in this context? Because where we have the monkey as a religious figure. Uh, so uh, how do we use that? Perhaps you have mm -hmm. given details of how the Papuans did that in your paper and I couldn't read it. Uh, so if you could explain how they use that Western marginalized figure uh, in a place where monkey is not a marginalized figure, but a religious, uh, perhaps even more, uh, you know, godly uh, and have a, a better uh, figurative position than humans, like in India, uh, at the present Indian religious political context. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Renu. Um, I'm sorry you weren't able to access um, the article, but I'm more than happy to send it to you afterwards. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really great question. I was um, yeah, earlier mentioning how uh, even in Indonesia, you know, there are, in Bali, for instance, um, Papu, uh, monkeys are, are considered gods as well uh, by a primarily Hindu population. Um, so, you know, I, I can't speak um, for, for the context of India, um, but one thing that, um, yeah, certainly you're right uh, in pointing out that the sort of, yeah, category of the monkey or primates um, certainly has been profoundly shaped um, through, you know, Western colonial sort of uh, epistemologies and social evolutionary frameworks. And many of the, a lot of the racializing dimensions of this species in Papua today, in, in Indonesia today, one can trace back, as I do in the article, um, to longer standing genealogies of Western secular uh, scientific thought um, along this sort of evolutionary spectrum. Um, it, it's a little bit, I suppose it's a little bit different um, in, in the context of Papua in the sense that it is uh, primarily Indonesians who are deploying the language of the monkey as a racializing stir. So it's not so much a, um, you know, it's, it's their whiteness, brownness and blackness are all working in, in relatively different ways. We're talking about a kind of different sort of color line to borrow um, Dubois term. Um, but I think what would be interesting is, you know, in this context, it's the monkey that is the, you know, uh, the racialized figure of Papuans. Um, I mean, there may be other species in other contexts um, that are being um, instrumentalized uh, in, in similarly racialized ways, right? Um, I don't know about dogs, for instance, and um, they're also an animal that's, uh, you know, often deployed as a racial slur uh, by Muslim, Muslim communities uh, in Indonesia. Um, so there may very well be other species um, that are, you know, figure more prominently within kind of racializing discourses in India and other and other places. Um, so I, I, even as even as the primate or the monkey um, certainly sort of stands out um, in terms of the way it's been uh, yeah, signified in, in, in Western colonial frameworks, um, I, I wouldn't want to suggest that it's it's the only one. Uh, I'm sure there are there are many other examples. Um, you know, there's a huge body of work on, on insects, for instance, um, you know, uh, that have also routinely been uh, instrumentalized in racializing militaristic securitization discourses, right? Um, so I, I, I'd love to hear if there are examples, um, you know, 
from your part of the world or elsewhere um, where, where, where other species um, are being uh, signified um, in that way. Um, Sophie, I wanted to talk, talk a little bit about the uh, use of cosmopolitics in the essay and, um, you know, and the difference, because in a lot of previous talks, uh, one of the words that we've encountered a lot is the word local. And um, even to talk about specific contexts or to talk about specific regions. And um, I, I wanted to know how you would distinguish cosmopolitical um, from, because I, the way I, I, I suppose the way you use it, cosmopolitical, um, accounts for multiple worlds and um, this kind of um, plurality. Uh, but at the same time, I suppose there is a connection um, to the local because you also, and I haven't read the Watson essay that you cite, but um, I know that there is a connection to the subaltern as well. So I, I, what exactly is the connection? Mm. I'm trying to remember what Watson said in his article. Um, <laughs> anyway, moving back to the main question. Um, but thank you for bringing us back to cosmopolitics. Um, yeah, um, first of all, I think, um, and this was what came from the reviews of this article, um, in the first round, uh, it, I hadn't made it clear that I was using cosmopolitics in the Stengarian sense, and not in the sense, um, you know, of, you know, the sort of uh, cosmopolitanism and that commitment to sort of the interests of a universal humanity um, in an increasingly globalized world. Um, so I had to be, be clear as to that distinction. Uh, but it's, it's a really important question you raise about you know, the local and the global, um, the one world world, the world of many worlds, um, what, 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 what kind of worldings and, and, and interworld sort of dynamics are we talking about here? And I think there are multiple layered um, locals and globals in, in this story, right? Um, even just, you know, Lo locals and globals that locals that transcend the particular place that is Papua that encompass the nation that is Indonesia and also the world more, more broadly speaking. Um, so I think for me, the way I try to what I was trying to do in the piece is to sort of really yeah follow Stengers in trying to expand the scope of the actors who shape um, the political. Um, you know, as part of more than human, a more than human cosmos. So in this case, thinking about monkeys also as cosmopolitical actors, um, and also to try to work through um, the ways in which uh, the different, the different locals that Marin inhabit, um, you know, their, their, their homes in Papua, um, their region as a colonized province, and the nation state of Indonesia within which they're embedded, and the global community um, that is driving much of the environmental destruction that's happening on their lands. Um, these are all nested worlds, right? Um, and, and many of the propositions um, that I outline in the piece speak really to that, right? Um, they speak to the ways in which the meaning of the, of the monkey changes, depending on what scale um, you're, you're thinking at, right? Um, the subject itself is transformed by the situatedness of, of its scalarity um, in ways that are inconclusive and, and, and never mutually exclusive, right? Um, one thing that came out from the interviews is that the meaning of the monkey as a political, cosmopolitical political actor is different in each of those six propositions, but um, Papuan, activists um, are, can very happily live with more than one proposition, right? It's not an either or between the six. Uh, the monkey can be more than human and not yet human and just as meaningful as human and less. And so they are not either ors, but a series of ands. Um, and in that sense too, I think that again multiplies the cosmopolitical proposal um, in the sense that any one entity can and always does inhabit multiple different identities, right? So it's 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 a more than human cosmos and it's a more than human politics and it's more than human entities um, that in themselves are also dispersed in their ontologies um, and often you know, internally contested and internally contested ways. And uh, and how much of that is uh, you know making sense of the world? Um, how much of that is the activist making sense of these different scales um, around them and um, kind of uh, projecting the political as a question that defines their lives, as opposed to, you, you know, would the cosmopolitical um, framing that accounts for the different scales be different from a kind of uh, post-colonial framing that 
um, you know, um, that would um, that would project a kind of cohesive identity, but it would probably eliminate or erase the non-human or the uh, presence of these symbols to make it a question of identity or history or the past or one single future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... That's a good question. I think, I think what really come came through from you know the conversations I had about you know the political and and particularly colonialism um, with with my Papuan friends um, is that these these asymmetries in power and privilege um, you know within and across species lines uh, can can never be reduced to any single thing. Um, so uh, certainly uh, you know the way in which the monkey comes to matter um, as a political as a political symbol um, is shaped as much by questions of ecology as it is by questions of race um, as it is by you know understandings of indigeneity um, and of sovereignty and so forth right um, so it's all of these different, um, thematics that intersect to produce to produce the you know dispersed meaning of this particular species in a way that cannot be um, yeah flattened or or, or or reduced to any single single one thing. Um, so I think they're all yeah thoroughly untangled would be my my best response. And also in the making, right? Um, these protests happened not long ago. Um, it was the first time that the monkey really started accruing these really different meanings, and most likely those meanings will continue to change um, as as activists continue to sort of work through. Um, the politics and, and, and the symbolics and, 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 and the realities of, of living under colonial rule and under sort of racializing assemblages. So I think the money, the monkey is going to continue to live on and, and transform um, in terms of its meaning. Um, it, it's, 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 it's not static um, and it's subject to ongoing sort of imaginative and speculative uh, labor on the part of these people who are continuing also their own struggles um, for recognition and, and, and justice um, under colonial rule. And um, and I find it so interesting that the interlocutors in the essay are the activists and mm -hmm. you know, that, that they are advocating for um, a better sense of um, definition for themselves and their communities. And, um, but um, are they able to, in, in, your, in, in the conversations you've had, how important is the symbol of the monkey in these? In, in is it something that comes up in their own uh, framing of the questions, or is it? And I, I think you've used the word strategy in the essay a number of times. Or is it a strategy that um, that is also political? Hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so, so when I started doing these interviews, uh, I, I, t I didn't, I, I, I absolutely did not imagine um, that the conversation would be so focused on the figure of the monkey. And uh, that was something that um, I ended up focusing on because it was what my interlocutors were most interested in talking about, right? Um, to, alongside, of course, its intersections with you know, human politics and, and human justice and so forth. So I kind of followed the flow of, of, of the kind of questions and themes that mattered to them, um, and in part it mattered to them because they disagreed among themselves as to what the meaning of the monkey really was, right? Uh, so a lot of my interviews were more sort of me sitting back and listening to them, having debates and, and deliberations and, and sometimes heated arguments um, about the relative worth and meaning and value um, of, of, the, of the monkey and of, and of themselves as a Papuan indigenous people. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think uh, the fact that this, the monkey was so central to the, our conversations was also shaped by the fact that all of these interviews uh, I was conducting against the backdrop of long term fieldwork among these same communities. Um, fieldwork that was very much focused on the environmental multi species dimensions of um, deforestation and oil palm expansion and other kinds of developmental projects that are uh, happening across this particular community's lands and territories, right? Um, so, you know, the, the fact that I, they knew that I had a pre-existing understanding of sorts and interest in their more than human perspectives and more than human, you know, cosmologies and more than human philosophies and practices and protocols 
certainly you know may have played a big part in shaping or determining why it was the monkey was so prominent in our kinds of conversations right um and, and interestingly enough I, I came to that field work from a prior background in human rights advocacy uh, where the conversation was very much about you know, human rights and human justice um and you know um it was a shift from activist to to anthropologist researcher that actually opened space for conversations about everything that was more than human right and um, all, all those dimensions of Papuan life worlds that don't make it into human rights petitions and human rights complaints and so forth, um, because they sort of don't fit within the epistemological frame of, of, of rights um, so far anyway, which tend to be human centric, right? Um, so that shift in itself was, was a major, um, often a major opening into the sort of multi-species dynamics of, of politics and, and, and of being and becoming and belonging in this particular part of the world. Darren, go ahead. Cool. Hi, Sophia, everyone. <laughs> um, so you kind of answered my question already in a way um, when you were talking about how um, the kind of people's understanding of the meaning of the monkey cannot be kind of reduced to any single dimension or factor. But and, and I understand that, you know, 16 individuals is by no means a <laughs> good enough sample size to make any kind of generalizations. But I'm nonetheless still, yeah, really interested and whether you have observed um, any kind of, I guess, identifiable kind of patterns or in terms of like um, identity lived experiences, um, like localities where, where they've lived, gender, like any other kind of factors that may have um, been kind of correlated to um, how um, how people felt about their proximity or distance with the figure of the monkey, um, you know, whether it's they felt like it was radically different or um, those who were more comfortable with identifying with monkeys. And, um, and because I got the sense that there is definitely like, in terms of age, in terms of gender, like um, there probably is some kind of difference there. So uh, um, because you know these individuals a lot better and you have also seen the, these um, activities and protests and, and, the, and happening at a broader scale and paid attention to that, I was just wondering if you could perhaps speak to, you know, where there there are some kind of observable correlations there. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, thanks, Darren, and thanks for being here. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, you know, the, the Marind peoples whom I was working with, um, whom I'm still working with, uh, you know, they, they live by a more than human, uh, you know, ethos in the sense uh, that they consider plants and animals to be sentient beings animate persons uh, with consequential meaningful lives um, in their own right. Um, so that uh, applies to, to native species uh, in their particular locales and forest plants and animals, and also elements um, who they consider to be relatives, grandparents or siblings, uh, and with whom they share common descent from ancestral spirits. Um, so relations of reciprocity and, and respect and reverence um, and, and restrained care are fundamental to the way they understand um, human and other than human um, entanglements. Um, so we're already, you know, the starting point is a kind of a multi-species, um, you know, perceptual life world and epistemology and ontology. Um, when it came to the monkey, it was a little bit there were some important differences, right? Um, this is not a native species, so it doesn't have a place within Marin's pre-existing and uh, more than human kinship systems. Um, it's, uh, it's, it was often if I described as foreign, um, and, and the foreign in, in, in Papuan parlance is, is often associated with the invasive, um, simply by virtue or vice of the colonial history, which, you know, in which uh, foreign entities and actors have often been invasive, um, occupied, Occupying um, appropriative sort of beings, right? And here I'm talking both, you know, human actors uh, and introduced species um, that are now taking over, you know, whole swaths um, of land and undermining naked native ecosystems. So the monkey came tethered with those associations with foreigners that unfortunately have been, you know, very much, um, you know, dampened by people's, people's people's experiences under settler colonial rule and, and in migration and so forth. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, the the, the, the the fact that many Papuans were aware that uh, monkeys across Indonesia and the tropics more broadly are losing their homes and habitats to deforestation and extractive projects was a major point of identification, right? Um, that they might differ in kind, but that they're facing a similar sort of loss 
um, of the world they require to survive and thrive. Um, so that sort of environmental context um, was, was really prevalently invoked um, in, in, in identifying actually a, a similarity um, across, across Papuan people and, and, and you know, primate species. Um, gender is a really good point. Uh, so the interview, the most of the activists um, in, in Papua tend to be men. Um, it's 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 a pretty dangerous. It's a dangerous part of the world to be an activist in. Uh, it's not the only one, of course, um, but most of my interlocutors um, were, did, were men. Most of the um, you know, people who are involved in advocacy and campaigns and so forth are men. Um, and there are cultural reasons for that, but there are also reasons of security and safety. Um, so the, the woman whom I, whom I talked to, whom I was interacting with uh, throughout my field work and you know, also had um, vital insights to share on, on what it means to inhabit a more than human world, um, just not in the context of advocacy, it was more in the context of, you know, taking me to the forest and, and um, you know, teaching me how to, well, first of all, notice, um, attune to, uh, observe, and immerse myself in the multi-species world of the forest, right? Um, and the kind of relations of care and nurture and nourishment um, that, um, you know, practices like, like, fishing and foraging and, and, and bivouacking um, and tail um, in, in this particular part of Papua. Um, so I guess that that's um, you know, one, one dimension of the gendered elements. Um, but now you're making me wonder whether I should have also asked whether the monkey itself as an animal and as a symbol is gendered um, in, in, in marine thought. Um, it's not something that came up in the course of our conversations. Uh, and maybe that's my answer that it, that, that it isn't. Um, but I think it's something that it would be worth exploring as well. Thank you, Dan. Anu, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is again in continuation with what was being discussed. And I was wondering if, um, you know, since this is a, a protest, this is a movement that's relatively new, started in 2019. I mean, the use of the monkey as a symbol. Um, and I was wondering if there was a kind of a backlash against the use of the monkey as a symbol, uh, you know, against mm -hmm. the appropriation of this symbol from amongst the activists, from amongst the Papuans who were protesting. Because uh, it seems to me that this was fairly um, widely used and became sort of the face of the protest, along with the flag that you've mentioned. But given that there were so many, um, the six propositions, you know, um, and there were people who sort of said, how can we be monkeys? We are humans and the monkeys not human, you know, without going on to the not yet human thing also. Um, so I wondered if it was really um, so homogenous when the when the protests mm -hmm. happened, or if there was disquiet, discord amongst the organizers, amongst the people at the forefront of the movement, mm -hmm. if there was any visible, tangible sort of uh, uh, refusal to use this. That's a great question. Um, I, I, I can't speak for discord or contentions during the protests themselves, but certainly during that particular period, um, during that summer, uh, social media, Twitter uh, was exploding with, um, you know, opposed and conflicting perspectives on whether or not uh, one should wear a monkey headdress, uh, whether or not one should hold a sign saying we are monkeys or we are not monkeys. Um, so there was a there was a flurry of uh, there was a flurry of activity happening in, in the online space. And that then that then got cut off when the government um, shut off the internet in West Papua uh, for numerous days. And I'm sure it, it would have continued had that not been the case. Um, but that was a primary space where these sorts of um, yeah, cosmopolitical tensions and, and disagreements were happening. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I, I tried to touch on it a little bit in, in, in the article. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, the, the symbol really, it really stuck. Um, th there was a trial um, of seven of the main uh, organizers of these protests that happened, I think I closed the article um, touching on that. Um, and there's an incredible photograph that was taken during uh, the verdict when they were sentenced to prison where the Papuan activist leaders um, are, are they're bare chested and they're wearing their traditional Papuan ornaments and they have written the word monkey across their chest in traditional white paints, right? Um, so again, that was a political, uh, that was a political move to enter a, a formal state courtroom, half naked wearing one's adornments and with the word monkey, even to the last minute of a trial, um, and even though they were all eventually sentenced um, to prison, um, I think speaks to the fact that um, 
regardless of how the monkey was signified, the very fact of having the word present in the room, visible, legible, mattered. Um, and perhaps it was, you know, an invitation to make the meaning we want out of it. But the point is the word had to be there, the, the, the symbol had to be there um, because it's it's still so much part of um, yeah, that sort of struggle for racial justice, um, one in which animals are, are, are Im Im implicated in, in different kinds of ways. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm still hung up on the cosmopolitical part, Sophie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was just thinking about Anna Singh's book, uh, Friction, which is, which tries to, um, through ethnography, explore what is local and talk about the global in relation to that. And I'm, I'm thinking about cosmopolitical um, in contrast to the local. And would, would cosmopolitical be more than, um, if we were to think about it in terms of spatiality or space, would it more than uh, be about the region or the local? Because we, we've had a lot of speakers um, come for table talks and uh, something that they've emphasized on is these local histories that can be, uh, that we can find out from talking to people on the ground in, in a specific region. Um, but the cosmopolitical seems to be different from that kind of um, ethnography or that kind of meaning making. You muted Sophie for some reason. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question I, and I appreciate that you're prodding and pushing me to problematize that local cosmopolitics framing that I'm using in the article. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think one of the reasons um, why I wanted to localize cosmopolitics um, is in part because cosmopolitical, cosmopolitical thinking is, is, is theory that stems from the global north, right? Um, it's thinkers like Isabel Stenger, it's thinkers like Boulevard Tour. Um, I think what I was trying to do in this article is to use the idea of the local to point to a grassroots cosmopolitanism in the sense that these are cosmopolitical tensions and, and, and formations and figurations that are being produced, uh, theorized, uh, intellectualized, uh, and acted upon by indigenous people themselves, right? Um, less as subjects of um, you know, global north theory than as active producers of their own theoretical kind of frameworks um, and, and political ontological, um, yeah meaning making activities, right? So perhaps it was less a sort of theoretical move than a political one, I suppose, um, trying to localize the cosmopolitical as something that happens in everyday life um, through the granular textures of life as lived among people, um, you know, who yeah, are, are, are most deeply and directly mired in that predicament of, of racial and social and environmental injustice. Um, so perhaps that's what I was Perhaps that's what I was trying to do, um, but I think I need to, to revisit that because I think you're right that, you know, the invocation of a local automatically sort of conjures a global, um, even though, you know, obviously those two don't exist as separate, separate or finite realms. Um, so, yeah, perhaps perhaps something other than local um, could have done the work um, otherwise, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, I think I was perhaps a grassroots cosmopolitics is more what I was going for. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it, but then if it's a grassroots cosmopolitics, how does that fit with um, activism and advocacy? Because one of the things that Stengers' cosmopolitics is trying to work against is the Kandian understanding of cosmopolitanism, which is based on a common world or understanding of a common good. Um, so, but you know, surely the activists uh, that you're talking to do have a common good or a common world in mind. It's just that mm -hmm. different from what the Indonesian government wants for them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, certainly the, you know, I would say the, act, the activists that I was working with, you know, have a certain vision um, of, of what um, that common world could or should look like. Um, but I think one of my, you know, one of, and here I'm speaking as an anthropologist, as so someone coming from a discipline, you know, that has a long and a violent history of association with colonialism in itself. Um, I, I, I do think that one of the risks, I suppose, of 
assuming that Papuans, you know, have an idea of a common world is that it um, perhaps risks re-entrenching certain sort of ideas of a, of, a, of a return to a pristine primordial past, right? Um, and in, in that vein, then sort of romanticizing or perhaps essentializing or, or reifying what the indigenous common world or, or harmonious world might look like. Um, and, and the reality on the ground is, is, is much more messy than that, right? Um, I mean, there are Papuan activists, there are also Papuans who are working in the Palmo sector, there are Papuans in government, and there are Papuans, you know, who are colluding with agribusiness corporations um, and furthering, you know, this deforestation and so forth. So um, activists represent one portion of a much broader community who is itself very split over whether to endorse or, or oppose, um, you know, these kinds of developmental schemes. Um, so I think I think perhaps perhaps that's where the messiness comes in, right? Do Papuans really share a vision of what that common rule might look like? Um, if you start to think about Papuan uh, diasporic politics and um, figures, you know, exiled Papuan leaders, uh, again, there there's often a, a big divide between the way they envision the future of Papua and the way that Papuans who are actually living under settler colonial rule um, imagine what it means to make do a lot of the time, right? Uh, to, to, to make do under these, these incredibly violent regimes, right? Um, so I think there again, the local and the global, and uh, Papua is also global through its diasporic uh, communities and through its leaders in exile and so forth, right? Um, so the cost of political you know, vision of the future again multiplies um, across spaces. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I don't know whether, you know, I, I wouldn't be too hasty to suggest that even the activists themselves have a sense of what that common world might look like, right? Uh, and if anything, those propositions speak to the fact that they, that they don't. Um, but what certainly comes, comes across in all six is that um, the humans and the other than humans matter in the making of those worlds. Whatever their positionality is, whatever their attributed morality is, um, they, they are part of the conversation, right? Even if they do not speak, um, even if they do not have a voice, um, they nonetheless matter as, as cosmopolitical actors. Um, and perhaps that's where, that's where the cosmopolitical angle can, can, can be good to think with, right? Um, that it expands the scope of, of who counts in political spaces and who are political actors um, and, and agents. That, that's really helpful, Sophie. I think I just have time for one more question, which would be, you know, in, in, this, in this framing um, of multiple, uh, multiple worlds, of uh, imagining a different cosmos and so on, um, how, would, how would we figure the Papuan being? Because, you know, there, there is a sense of, um, and this is something that comes through in Stengus's formulation as well that there is even when um even when worlds are being made there is very much a sense of the self um, which may not be um which may not be cohesive but there is still a sense of the self that is pushing to make new worlds happen and um so then is this kind of um singular papuan being necessary to enact the kinds of justice um, that that is being talked about in the essay? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And I, I don't think it's necessarily something that Papuan strives for, um, a, a singular Papuan being. Um, perhaps we're talking more about a plural Papuan becoming, right? Uh, and that's not uh, limited to Papuans, of course, um, but probably to all beings, right? That we are uh, more becomings than beings, uh, you know, transforming dynamic processual entities and relations uh, or relational entities. Um, so I think that's a question that, um, it's one that, that my friends uh, often would talk about, particularly the activists, right? Um, and this goes back to one of the reasons why I left the activist world to do ethnographic research, um, is that advocacy often does require the construction of a singular identity, right? Uh, in, in the interests of effective advocacy, right? Of having a, um, you know, a solid shared claim uh, and demands and so forth um, that are then communicated to particular kinds of audiences. So strategic essentialism is a big part of what it, what it means to, 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 to undertake advocacy and activism, right? Um, but outside of the space of the advocacy and the lobbying and the activism is where you really get to see how much more messy um, the, the, that sense of identity and, and belonging and becoming is, right? Right. Um, and that was what I was able to get insights into when, when I'm, my own positionality shifted from activist, you know, to, to, to ethnographer, right? Um, I was 
I was I was entrusted with perspectives and stories and disagreements and uh, disagree and 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 um, and arguments that I, I wasn't otherwise privy to um, in the context of you know a sort of very targeted strategic sort of advocacy context. Um, so I don't think a singular being is, is possible or desirable, uh, but I think that different contexts. Um, do make um, uh, particular insights into the, the necessity of singularity at certain moments and the embrace of plurality at others um, make sense, right? And people are constantly navigating across, across plurality and singularity um, through, through everyday life um, in the context of different audiences and interlocutors, right? Um, so again, we're back to, I suppose, situated knowledges and situated positionalities and, and perhaps a, a situated rather than localized cosmopolitics. Thanks a lot, Sophie. Um, that was very interesting. And um, yeah, I think it's been very interesting to think with you through some of these questions. Thanks everyone for being here and we hope to see you again in any of the future sessions. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, Anu, for making this space possible and all of you for, for reading the piece as well. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for being here, Susan. Thanks for you, Sophie. Bye.